All right, I've been the, given the green light. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the UPU Sustainability Roundtable, Host for Planet. Before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping details that I'd like to share with you. First, we have interpretation in French, Spanish, and English. So please select your language of choice by clicking on the world icon at the bottom of your screen. When we reach the question and answer portion of the program, we will not be using the chat function. So please type any questions you would like to ask in the Q&A function, which stands for question and answer. So I'm Susan Alexander, the Sustainability Services Program Manager at the UPU International Bureau. And I'm honored to present a very robust panel on energy reliability and climate funding. Before we begin with our guests today, I would like to invite the Deputy Director General of the UPU, Mr. Marian Oswald, to deliver his words of welcome. Mr. Oswald, please. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, dear colleagues, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you all at this virtual event, which is a part of our celebration of World Post Day. Actually, it's uh, uh, World Post Week here in Bern. The theme for 2022 is Post for Planet, and the subject of this roundtable, the transition to green energy, is of course very topical. Energy is in the news right now for many reasons. Uh, on the one hand, we have an energy crisis, and on the other, we have a climate crisis. It is the responsibility of international organizations such as UPU to respond to such challenges. Both of these crises have immediate and practical implications for the postal sector. Any threats to the supply of affordability of energy should be considered as a threat to the postal system itself. Energy is central to our core postal business and to the modernization of the sector through the digitalization and di diversification. Similarly, climate change is a threat to the integrity and quality of our postal networks and is changing the way posts do business. Hardly a week passes without a major heat wave or storm that scientists confirm has been strengthened by the global emission of greenhouse gases. What matters is how we respond to these threats. Our postal infrastructure needs to be resilient to these disruptions. We need to invest in infrastructure that can adapt to a new reality and recover quickly from extreme events. We also need to be part of the climate solution, reducing our energy demands and greening our operations so that we are in the delivery partner of choice for increasingly climate aware customers. Today, we have convened several experts to give their perspective on the transition to renewables, a solution for the postal sector that can improve its climate and energy resilience. I would like to extend my gratitude to our speakers and I encourage participants to full advantage of their knowledge during the question and answer period. In this increasingly connected world, we cannot solve big problems in isolation. It is vital that we build synergies between our energy security and our climate solutions. I thank you for being here to listen, to learn more about how we can work together in the pursuit of greener energy pathways for the postal sector. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words of welcome. And now I would like to first uh, introduce our first panelist, which is Mr. Siva Somasundram. He's the Director of Policy, Regulation and Markets here at the UPU. Uh, Siva, if you would go ahead, please, we'd be happy to start and, and, and get going. Thanks very much, Susan, and uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it is, I, I've tended to use the words good day because it's a lot easier than having to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, but it's really uh, very exciting to be here uh, on this webinar with you, um, given the critical importance um, and topicality of the issues we'll be discussing today. Um, as the Deputy Director General uh, indicated, energy security, the climate crisis, and business resilience in the face of crisis uh, are topics that are frequently in the headlines. And, and there are no surprises here, given everything that's happening in the world. But I do think that there is uh, 
a nexus between energy security agenda and the climate action agenda that policymakers are grappling with and which don't always attract a lot of attention. And I think this webinar gives us a, a, a timely opportunity to delve deeper into these synergies um, from the perspective of the postal sector in particular. So let me, um, and, and I'm fully respectful of the fact that we may have um, participants today who aren't necessarily uh, postal sector um, representatives. Uh, we, we may have uh, representatives from other um, areas of industry. Uh, and so bear with me as I sort of try and articulate um, the, the sort of important role that energy plays uh, in the postal sector, because in understanding that role, we understand why energy security is important. And then that allows me to sort of also talk a bit about how it's connected to climate action and, and, and the climate agenda. Now, um, I think it's pretty obvious that transporting letters and parcels is the core of the postal business. And, and to do that, you, you need delivery and freight vehicles. Uh, and a lot of this is actually powered uh, using fossil fuels. Um, and so transportation remains the most energy hungry part uh, of the postal business. Yet it's not just the vehicles. I think it's also important to recognize that in um, the postal sector, there is a drive, a constant drive to improve quality, uh, the diversity of services that postal operators offer. And this has caused postal operators across the world to invest uh, a considerable amount in automation and digitization. Um, items are sorted, uh, tracked, uh, and using systems that actually need a lot of power. And as we push towards the digitization of postal services, these energy demands are going to increase for sure. Now, on top of all of that, I think it's also important to recognize that the postal sector is a major employer. And postal workers have the right to be comfortable uh, in their working conditions, which means that sorting centers, offices, they all need to be well networked, well lit, heated or cooled as required. And, and this again points to the energy demand uh, that arises out of uh, postal operations. Um, and ultimately, in, in, in many ways, um, the actual business of postal services in terms of packaging, the use of materials, all of this is actually energy um, um, high in its demand. Um, and when we have such a dependency on energy, uh, disruptions to energy supply or increases in energy costs uh, can have a huge bearing uh, on the viability of many posts. Um, and when we talk about energy security, this is really about the uninterrupted access to sufficient energy at affordable uh, prices. But as we've seen uh, with recent events in Europe, we cannot take that security for granted. Uh, the supply network for fossil fuels and even for electricity are, are vulnerable to a whole range of factors, um, economic and social factors, conflict, and even natural disasters exacerbated by climate change. And in some cases, energy security for the postal sector can be compromised by the exact moment when we actually need it. Um, so if you take, for example, some of the, the more recent news events around hurricanes and so on, when, when these destroy fuel depots or a heat wave causes uh, the energy grid to, ca uh, to crash, uh, postal operators being often the, the first service providers on the ground, um, their sources of energy are critical in order for them to be actually able to deliver on those essential services. So it's clear, at least uh, for us in the UPU, that there needs to be solutions to the immediate and future energy crisis that may come around the corner. And we need to build a longer term resilience to ensuring uh, our energy supply. And this brings me to the climate action agenda and its nexus with energy security. Now, Post, it's true to say, are increasingly engaged in responding to the climate crisis. Now, the UPU has recognized this, uh, the member states have recognized this as being a core policy and business issue. Um, and and in, that, uh, in, in that sense, there's also uh, a need to deal with the, uh, the climate crisis through resilient energy supplies, because um, when you have um, a clear uh, direction on uh, climate action and, and, and how you deal with the climate impacts of your operations, you could also in some ways uh, have an impact on your energy demands. Um, what is 
becoming evident is that um, there is this nexus. Uh, if we can find ways by which we can reduce energy demand, uh, this through energy efficiency use, um, this could actually result in a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so while the total energy needs uh, can be um, in, in some ways adjusted to respond to crisis, um, uh, for example, the energy security crisis, that too has an impact on, 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 on our climate agenda. So the electrification of vehicles, um, purchasing electricity, electricity from local renewable sources, all of this can together help increase the energy security of the postal system. I think later on today, we will hear the experience of um, some of our postal operators in, on mapping out uh, green and secure energy pathways. And, and, and this has been quite a, uh, an exciting journey for them um, and, and, and how they've actually gone about funding this transition. Um, just to wrap up quickly, Susan, I, I think it's important to sort of uh, also bring to the attention of the audience some of the work that the UPU has started on uh, in, in this space. Um, at the um, uh, UPU Abidjan Congress um, in 2021, um, member states uh, adopted Congress Resol Resolution C-17. Now, this was um, very importantly um, adopted unanimously by member states, and it was a clear signal uh, to, uh, to everyone um, that the postal sector takes climate action um, uh, uh, as, as a critical uh, piece of the future that we need to deal with. Uh, and so there's a commitment to looking and working towards uh, voluntary targets in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there is a commitment to looking at ways in which we can uh, share our experience, our knowledge, uh, and also to uh, support the development of postal infrastructure that is going to have um, um, a lesser carbon footprint, uh, as it were. Um, so as part of this journey, which has started, I, I think what we're going to hear today and in the months ahead is, is the work that needs to be undertaken in order to set some baselines around this, uh, to fill the gaps in our knowledge, uh, and to get member states uh, talking to each other um, and with obviously with civil society and, 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 and the private sector in finding ways in which the postal sector can make a significant contribution uh, to um, you know, the global efforts to dealing with climate action uh, and, and the climate agenda. But the basic point around all of this is that while at this point in time, we might be quite concerned about where we're getting our electricity in order to run our vehicles or electricity to run our equipment and so on, it is also, uh, um, strategically important to think through how, as we look to alternative supplies of energy, that this could also be done in a way that has uh, a positive and beneficial impact uh, on, on, on the climate. So with that, Susan, I, I, I hand over uh, the floor to you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction uh, to the subject and, and, and to what we will be discussing later on uh, in this hour and a half. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, next, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Rabia Feruki. She is the Director of the Knowledge, Policy and Finance Center at the International Renewable Energy Agency, better known as IRENA, and she's here today to tell us uh, some more about her organization. Rabia? Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Oswald, for the introduction and, and, and Shiva for the very nice presentation. Um, I, it's really a pleasure to, for me to be here today and thank you for the invitation. So I, I'll be very brief uh, in the five minutes that I have, I'll quickly go through what ARENA does and some of the broader, uh, highlight some of the broader issues around the energy transition uh, and then I'm available for questions, of course. So as many uh, of you might know, ARENA is the leading global intergovernmental organization working on the energy transition and it has about 165 member countries. Uh, engaged in this process. So beyond the, 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 the technical assistance, let's say, and the uh, capacity building efforts uh, to countries and regions, uh, what ARENA also undertakes is a wide range of uh, analytical uh, uh, work and tools uh, on the different dimensions of the energy transition. So just in a, in a, a nutshell, our flagship publication uh, on shaping, uh, let's say, a, a resilient uh, energy system is called the World Energy Transition Outlook. And 
What makes the report unique uh, and informs uh, Arena's work as a whole is that not only it provides uh, a techni technological pathway to 2050, uh, but also translate though, that pathway and, and, and those techno technology uh, solutions into socioeconomic variables. So this offers decision makers um, a, a deeper understanding of the opportunities, but also the challenges on the road ahead. Um, I was asked to explain why a transition to renewable energy is important. And uh, let me start with the global picture, which, uh, which is characterized by a number of different challenges. One obviously is the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has had a large impact on global energy demands and supply dynamics, uh, which had had uh, uh, um, uh, the, the Ukraine crisis, as just mentioned by, by Shiva which has obviously heightened our concern uh, over energy security in many European countries. Though I would like to note that the energy security and, uh, uh, is, has been a challenge um, uh, uh, by the great majority of humanity on a daily basis. So we can have a discussion on that. And then the climate emergency, obviously, which will impact uh, both us and future generation if we don't manage to, 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 to mitigate, to adapt and to mitigate climate change. So these challenges come in addition to the imperative to close the energy access uh, uh, gap in developing countries and enable sustainable development globally. Uh, because while some of us are over-consuming, uh, many of us are uh, of uh, others, because uh, that's not my case, thankfully, are under-consuming. So ARENA's outlook, uh, World Energy Transition Outlook, shows that ramping up renewables together with an aggressive energy efficiency strategy. So Shiva, I completely agree with you. Energy efficiency is our first duty. Uh, is, is really the most realistic path towards halving the emission by 2030, as recommended by the IPCC, and a transition to a renewables-based energy system will be critical uh, for enhancing the energy security for, uh, for, for the security of supply that you discussed, but also to address energy poverty, etc. So the key actions that we outline, and really I'm, I'm being very, I really provide just highlight, highlights, is a resolute replacement of coal with renewables. That's number one. A stop of subsidizing fossil fuels and investing in new fossil fuel supply, uh, uh, in new, sorry, uh, a renewable supply. The pace of renewables deployment actually must triple according to our estimates, so three times more annual addition of renewable energy by 2030. The, fish, the efficient use of energy across all sectors, as mentioned, but uh, that must increase through innovation, the maritime management, etc. The decarbonization of end user sector through electrification. So electrification is really important. That's why speaking about electric vehicle, the transport that you mentioned for UPU is very important. Green hydrogen is becoming a, a big, uh, a big uh, solution right now. And the direct use of renewables that those three should be really prioritized. And finally, a really comprehensive set of policies uh, is, is needed to achieve uh, the, the necessary levels of deployment by 2030. And by comprehensive, I mean not only renewables deployment and other energy policies, energy efficiency, for example, but also enabling policies to maximize the benefits and, and address the challenges that a transition can bring with it. So that means industrial policy, labor policy, social policies, etc. Now, significant investments are, 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 will be required in the coming years to have a fighting chance to stay on track to, for the 1.5 uh, in 2050. And by 2030, we find that globally, we must mobilize investments of about 5.7 trillion per year. And plan investment will have to be redirected on top of that from fossil fuels towards the energy transition technologies. Um, uh, and so to what uh, to that we need to of course attach a price tag on uh, on on the price uh, or on the investment needed for for policy 
related to other energy sectors, but beyond that, that are very often taken for granted. The skills, uh, the, you spoke about digitalization, that means skilling, reskilling, educating, etc. All of that enabling environment is essential for the transition. And I have one more point and I'll finish, I promise Suzanne, is the fact that the success of the energy transition really hinges on the socioeconomic and climate gains that, that are necessary for society basically to embrace and, and, and have political um, support. And there's no alternative. It's only if we invest in time uh, in, in, into efficient, sustainable, uh, a resilient and equitable energy system, including the supply chains, and we can speak about supply chain disruptions through COVID, we can we achieve our goal of, of, of powering a future socioeconomic development. Thank you very much for the time you're giving me. Rabia, thank you so much. Um, we are all very aware of, of the situation, but, but to hear it from you uh, is truly a wake-up call. Um, it, it, it's very important, um, and we appreciate you taking the time to tell us. Um, I, I do have a, a, a follow-up question for you. Um, of course, the posts uh, are in various states of, of uh, uh, government organizations or quasi-governmental or partially privatized, and uh, this is, is something that we are working with within the, the, the postal world. Um, and so, we think that it's rather important for posts and governments to to coordinate um, at national level, uh, you know, on access for investment in renewable projects. Um, how do you think that that designated operators could best work with their national governments on this green energy pathway? What what are your thoughts on on how that can happen? So our constituency are governments at uh, at Arena, right? So. Uh, and, and the stakeholders are many different kinds of stakeholders. So what we always try, obviously our first, cons first clients or constituency are governments and we work for them. But what we really try to do is, uh, is, is try to find this synergy that Shiva was speaking uh, about uh, between the different types of stakeholders, private sector, NGOs, civil society, academics, etc. And we have within IRENA, and it has worked really well, uh, uh, a it's under my division, uh, a coalition for action that brings all types of stakeholders together to address some of the issues and try to see what are their, 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 their um, uh, demands and what are the offers on the other side. And uh, I mean, I can go into a few examples, but we have a sustainable jobs platform where we listen to governments to, we, and their needs we listen to uh, private sector, we listen to trade unions, and, and then the other stakeholders are well, as well, civil servants, and uh, civil society and, and, and NGOs. And I think that that discussion, that uh, uh, exchange is extremely important because you, find, you, you, you realize what the challenges are and what the solutions could be. You also, uh, as was mentioned earlier, best practice, exchange of best practice is extremely important, trying to uh, also provide policy advice that we do in terms of targets, in terms of options, procuring, as was mentioned, uh, renewable electricity, uh, etc. So I think the, the most important is, is, is to have that dialogue between the different stakeholders in order to try to find what the best solutions, uh, what the best solutions are for a specific context and specific. I mean, you have this problem in the post postal services, but you know, every country almost, or or the the number of countries that start uh, from different uh, conditions is 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 also quite challenging. So you have to adapt to the, those specific conditions of countries in order to promote renewables or, the, or, or energy efficiency, et cetera. Plus you have also dependencies. I mean, you have a lot of uh, uh, historically uh, entrenched uh, dependencies in energy, especially with energy flows and trade, et cetera, that you have, to, you have to address. You cannot simply come and say, okay, you need to simply change your whole system, energy system and plug in renewables, it's a bit more complicated than that. So I think that that discussion is very important. The dialogue that between the different stakeholders is essential. 
Thank you. Uh, Siva, how are we doing in the UPU so far as we're beginning to to uh, implement the, the climate action resolution that was passed at our Congress last year? Um, Susan, th thank you for that question. Uh, and I and I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points that Rabia made, which I think is, is sort of relevant to what we're doing in the UPU as well. Um, Rabia is absolutely spot on when she says that um, this is the issues around climate um, action and energy security is, is, is broader than the postal sector, which means that uh, we should be part of a dialogue uh, and, and potentially a whole of government approach to dealing with these things. Um, the post uh, traditionally because of its role uh, in connecting citizens uh, and traditionally because of its ownership status, uh, typically a government department. Uh, in, in many countries, it, it has a, a unique role, a unique status, and, and, it, and it puts itself in, a, in quite a, um, uh, an important position um, in the eyes of governments when it comes to dealing with public policy issues. Uh, and if you treat climate action and the impact on, 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 on the climate uh, as such an issue, then there is a question around what can the postal sector do to contribute to, uh, to dealing with, uh, with, with this uh, public policy problem. Um, and and it, it could extend from simple things like um, if we were to, um, uh, uh, to, to green the post, um, that would of course uh, result in, 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 a, in, a, in a small carbon footprint. Uh, but it could also involve um, uh, ideas around smart cities and, and, and the role that the post could play in, in promoting uh, the use of technology and, and, and innovation uh, in, in the context of making cities and, 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 and the communication channels between citizens uh, a lot more uh, climate neutral. Um, so that, that's the first point. My, my second point, um, uh, and a point that Rabia also made, um, is the need uh, to think about this um, in, in some ways from the perspective of all stakeholders, and which means that uh, for most posts, uh, they are commercial enterprises as well. And, and there is a need to you know, make sure that you cover your costs and, 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 and you're, you're meeting the needs of your customers. And, and the demands of civil society uh, is increasingly heading towards a, uh, a greater focus on um, products and services, that are climate neutral or at least contribute to uh, a, a, a better climate impact. Uh, and so there is a, a unique opportunity in some ways for POS uh, to, to sort of go ahead and, 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 and corner this particular niche around greener products and services that citizens are demanding. Uh, and so we just need to sort of think outside of the box and, 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 and try and meet those uh, growing demands and 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 how all of the, all of this connected to the UPU. Well, as you know, the UPU is is the intergovernmental forum where um, governments talk to each other about the postal sector and how we can cooperate in relation to the postal services. Um, there is clearly a commitment to it, um, trying to establish some baseline measurements around the impact of the postal sector on, on the climate in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and, and a, a willingness to look at how those greenhouse gas emissions can uh, be reduced. So, you know, there is that push towards um, recognizing that uh, the postal sector as a element of the logistics, the broader logistics sector is a contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and how do we tackle that? Uh, but also more broadly, I think, there is a commitment around um, best practice uh, and sharing of experiences because, uh, as Rabia says, um, there is um, huge disparities in levels of development, understanding, and, and technology access. Uh, and we do have some very leading lights in, in, in postal operators who are doing excellent work uh, when it comes to climate action. Uh, and, and, and there is a lot to be learned and which can be replicated. And, and so having a common platform such as the UPU to allow for that information exchange and, and knowledge sharing, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, essentially a public good that we can provide for. Um, and, and finally, all of this needs money, uh, and, 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 and there is money out there. And the, and the question is, how do we actually go about creating the channels by which um, the supply meets demand? 
Uh, and, and again, I think there is a role for the UPU as, as, as an intergovernmental forum to allow for exactly that. And so it's these sort of three main dimensions that I think the UPU is trying to, uh, to get its act together on. Uh, we've started the journey. We, we, we do have a, a long way to go, but I, I'm, I'm very confident we'll get there. And I'm sorry I took a long time on that, but it was important to sort of set the scene on this one. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you both uh, for setting the scene here. And now we're going to ask our two postal operators who, who will be able to, to give us a bit more in detail uh, what they have done so far. And then of course, you'll stay with us so that we can have more questions uh, directed to you after we've had their presentations. So thank you. And now I would like to introduce Ms. Margot Meidinger, and she is the head of European uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Affairs for La Poste France. And uh, Margot, without uh, further ado, we would love to, to hear your presentation, please. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, Dublin, where I am for Post Europe General Assembly. Uh, should I share my presentation, Susan? Yes, yes I'll, please. I'll try to do it. Uh, let me see how I can do it. Uh, I think I'm not sure I know how to do it. Sorry for that. Um, is there any way you could? Yes, yeah, thanks. Yes, Margo, Kayla has put it up Great. for you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, uh, je vais continuer ma présentation en français. So I'm going to continue my presentation in French. So I'm going to speak to you from the post perspective in France and our green and sustainable bonds. I'm going to present a few facts first, and then I will set the scene and then speak about green bonds. So, the post has issued two different types of bonds. In 2018, we issued our very first green bond for a value of 500 million euro. And this enabled us to fund 11 projects, 71% for green buildings and 29% for green transport. These are the two main approaches to green the postal services. In 2018, when we issued our first green bond, the post said that we would release a new bond and we did that in 2022. Just a month ago, would you believe, on the 7th of September, we issued a new sustainable bond. This is a green bond with social issues included as well. So this goes one step further because it enables us to fund green green and social aspects. This bond was worth is worth 1.2 billion euros and it was oversubscribed by 2.4 times with 130 investors. If we look at categories in more detail, particularly the green ones that are of interest to us today, we mainly focus on green buildings, clean transport, but we also increase the scope to, increase, to include renewable energy. We also included energy efficiency and the circular economy, so five green assets. The new aspect to this bond were the social assets, including uh, youth integration and socio-economic development. On the next slide, I would like to speak to you a bit about assets for green buildings. What we understand about green buildings are green buildings that use renewable energy, where they are self-sustainable, and they are buildings that are designed in a green way. They are logistic, urban logistic hubs. They are decar decarbonized specifically for the first and last mile processes. 
So these are green buildings, and their aim is to really uh, transform the first and last mile processes into a more greener process. So those are a few examples of what we did, and now why did we issue green and sustainable bonds? Why it did in the post um, l lend from the borrow rather from the private market? Well, firstly, because as a business, we need cash to finance our uh, external growth. In order to finance our growth, we wanted to diversify our sources of funding. In order to do that, we needed to either self-finance ourselves or to obtain um, debt, which is this example of a green and sustainable bond. So why did we want to borrow specifically for a green and sustainable bond? Well, in 2018, the idea of greening was clear because at the time, and this trend has continued, that investors want to invest in this type of project. Greening, or rather bonds, are one of the main way of greening our economy, and it is one of the measures of the European Commission with a green tax. They want to encourage investors to invest in green activities, and this is why investors really look for this type of product because they have to show that they are investing in green economies. So they are create, creating green and sustainable bonds that are attractive to their own clients. There are three main concrete uh, advantages of green and sustainable bonds. The first being that because these are attractive assets, this means that they have interesting rates that are, are often more interesting than market rates for other types of bonds. The second reason is that it enabled us to diversify our investor base compared to classic bonds. There is a Norwegian sovereign fund who joined us who had never been involved with us before, which also enabled us to reach international investors. 60% of our investors were in fact international investors and we also saw investors from Asia because this is, and this is interesting because post, the post is developing over there as well. And the third advantage, which is last but not least, enables us to add value to our social, corporate social responsibility and of course investors are interested in CSR as well and this is particularly important when we go to trade shows or road shows where we will have to present our projects and when we do so we need to highlight our priorities for sustainable development. This worked effectively because in 2018 the green bond was uh, oversubscribed by roughly four times, and in 2022 it was oversubscribed by um, over two times. So it was a great success both times. These assets are future focused, and that is why it was such a good success. So this is uh, the heart of our bond, and I'm open to all questions on this uh, fascinating subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margo. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rabia needs to leave, but I thought perhaps, Rabia, you would like quickly to, to say your farewells? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's uh, really enlightening for me to see other sectors that I'm not used to look at. And uh, I hope we can stay in touch and see what we might be able to do together. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Absolutely, Rabia. Thank you so much uh, for being able to, for us being able to connect with your sector as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now I think uh, we we can go uh, to uh, 
uh, Latin American now to Costa Rica and, and hear about a different experience from another post. And ladies and gentlemen, after that, we will be opening up for questions uh, for all of the panelists. And um, also, I would like just to quickly remind you that we do have interpretation um, as our next speaker will also be speaking in, in Spanish after we've, we've heard uh, in French. Um, so I would like now to introduce Mr. Verne Alexander Rodriguez. Martinez, who is the coordinator of Environmental Management Commission in Correas, Costa Rica. Verne, we'd like to hear from you. Good day, everyone, and thank you. On behalf of Costa Rica, we are extremely honored to be here and would like to thank Yubu for giving us this opportunity to present with you today. I'm going to share my presentation with you. To start then, regarding sustainable development in Costa Rica. We would like to say that one of the key points right now is environmental cooperative programs. We have an implementation plan. It uses the OSCAR tool, which is an international tool to measure CO2. We also focus on sustainability, sustainable mobility and use international cooperative agreements and we are working on a plan regarding environmental policy in Costa Rica. We have an economic model that enables us to bring in environmental policies and green our systems and enables us to green our supply chains. Regarding our environmental policy, the aim is to reduce the consumption of water, fuel and other supplies to achieve carbon neutrality. For car to achieve carbon neutrality, we also aim at reducing waste. Then we have also have a green building aspect as well. For social responsibility, we look at uh, health, security, promotion of diversity, gender new and gender neutrality. We have a, an ethical code at the, in the post and we have um, close collaboration with our clients and institutional alliances. Regarding the implement, plan of implementation, we have an internal and external plans for our clients and collaborators. One of our themes is a collaboration action. This is done through fireside chats and negotiations regarding the environmental policy. For our environmental plan, we have activities you to develop KPIs and achieve them uh, Verney, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, CSS but I do well. believe uh, perhaps uh, the the presentation is frozen. And that perhaps uh, we should try and correct this. If you can just wait for just a moment. Maybe Kayla, once again, you could jump in and save us. Apologies, everyone, just a, a moment, please. Bernie, if you would please stop sharing. And if you will just ask our uh, technicians just to move to the next, then I think, I think we'll be uh, So, can I ask someone? Uh, if uh, if we're back, are we back to? Uh, 
Verney, if you can stop sharing the screen. Well, perhaps, uh, yes. Okay, Vernie, is this the correct screen for you? Is this the correct slide? Could I ask the Spanish interpreter to ask if this is the correct slide for Mr. Rodriguez? Es correcto, pero está en idioma. Yes, it's correct, but it's in English. Uh, can we proceed with the English? Will that work for you? No. Nope. Uh, I do believe uh, we have Yo the podría Spanish. Volver a compartirla. I can share it again. Let's try again. For you to share. All right, I'm sorry, if you would please continue, please forgive, forgive the interruption and we'll see if the slides will change when you are speaking. Listo. Eh, bueno, voy a okay, I'm going to continue regarding best procurement practices for sustainability. It's important that it's to note that we have incorporated criteria of environmental sustainability regarding buying goods and services and one of those aspects is buying electronic equipment where we demand good energy practices. We ask our suppliers to use recycled or recycled materials for packaging and for their materials. It's important to also note that at the end of electronic equipment li life cycle of an object that it should be reused or recycled. We also provide, ask our providers to present a program for the waste generated by their activities. We also have a program, institutional environmental management program. This program enables us to carry out studies of CO2 emissions and we can also study greenhouse gas emissions. This generates reports on water, electricity, fuel and paper consumption and on waste generated. In this case, it is audited by the Ministry of the Environment and Energy in Costa Rica and so far we have received Four, four uh, three reports, and the fourth is going to be handed in on the 20th of October this year. This is one of the examples of why the Post has received four Environmental Excellence Awards. Regarding the Oscar um, report, this tool, which is very useful, this has enabled us to measure and carry out studies regarding transport, and the, num the amount of emissions created by transport, building electricity, travel, procurement of goods and services, and professional travel and emissions. In 2020, there were 4,496 tons of CO2. In uh, regarding electric vehicles, Costa Rica is involved in a pilot plan to turn its uh, whole f um, fleet of vehicles into green vehicles. So far, we have 49 electric motorcycles. 
which have several benefits, of course. They reduce the carbon footprint, they reduce the fossil fuel consumption, they reduce maintenance costs, and there is an incentive on behalf of the government in that there is that these vehicles are exempt from taxation. Costa Rica Post is also encouraged to to deliver eco delivery innovative services. We are currently working on a com convention for the Green Climate Fund from the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, CABE. The aim is to obtain more green vehicles to substitute vehicles by tri tricycles and quadricycles. We are also investing in solar panels that will be put, added onto our buildings, and this will all come to a total credit of $3.7 million. This is the end of Costa Rica's presentation. I would like to thank you very much, and for you, Susan, for the organization and for this opportunity. And I would like to thank all the representatives that are here on behalf of all of the posts. I'm available for any questions that you would like to ask me. Thank you once again. Very good. Thank you, Vernie, for that presentation. And now uh, we'd like to open up uh, questions to Vernie and Margot and to Siva. And also, uh, if, if, if you would like to uh, ask each other questions as well, uh, that's also allowed. We'd be very happy. And I see that Siva would love to answer, ask her the first question. Please, Siva, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Susan. And I couldn't help um, uh, here uh, with some pride uh, when Bernie talked about how important Oscar has been in um, uh, the journey of Corios in, 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 in getting itself uh, onto a, a journey towards sustainability. Um, I was, was wanting to understand, and, and perhaps uh, Bernie can talk to it, uh, from our perspective, there are really two benefits that come out of uh, Oscar. Um, first and foremost, obviously, uh, it, it actually gets you to start measuring your energy consumption and, and looking at it uh, you, you know, at a granular level where uh, you're, you're actually making use of uh, your, your main sources of energy. And that then results in understanding um, the, the carbon footprint. Uh, and, and it's only through understanding your energy usage and its impact on, 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 on carbon output that you actually can then begin to start uh, putting in place mitigation measures. Uh, that's that's really the, the benefit of Oscar, but maybe Bernie can talk a bit more about this because um, it, it's one of the things that we're very keen to promote, uh, and, and, and that is to have uh, designated operators across the world uh, adopt Oscar uh, because it then allows uh, us to sort of uh, get to a stage where we can baseline uh, emissions in a, in a more um, uh, constructive and in, 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 in clear manner. Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. In this case, we applied this tool to Costa Rica Post for several years now. It was it'd been a very useful tool. And we noticed that uh, in Costa Rica, 99% of energy in Costa Rica is renewable. Oscar enabled us to look at the consumption of each of our services. <clears throat> we were able to look at each collaborator, how many emissions they produce. Regarding our carbon footprint, it enabled us to also look at our fleet of vehicles, create a baseline and establish how many vehicles we have compared to the levels of energy consumption. And then it meant that we could make the decision to migrate to electric vehicles to reduce our carbon footprint. Similarly, in Costa Rica, we are uh, um, in touch with our government because they really support us on the environmental aspect from the Ministry of Environment and Energy. 
we are currently approving a new law which will be called the law of government procurement and it will have a, a, um, points about our providers and this will uh, incorporate principles about um, energy and sustainability this means that um, costa rica post is committed to um, environmental policies and this this tool is a huge help. It helps us to make decisions to look at what type of investment we can um, use. We, it helps us to look for international aid, um, like the tool from the Inter-American Central Bank. And Oscar was the base that helped us to present our need to renovate our fleet of vehicles from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles and I would like to remind you that 99% of our energy in Costa Rica is renewable energy so we're also working on the solar panel project we're um, putting up solar panels on in our own ba buildings so we ourselves generate our own energy thank you thank you very much Vernie uh, Mr. Oswald the Deputy Director General has a question please uh, thank you, Susan. I just wanted to compliment Margot. Hello, Margot. And regards to post your friends in Dublin. Uh, actually, uh, La Poste was always very instrumental when it comes to different solutions. Um, and I was wondering, um, uh, was uh, uh, French government uh, sort of supported towards your initiative? Uh, uh, was uh, French government in any way involved or not at all? And the second question is, um, um, uh, are bonds also available to the uh, private person or, or only to the, I don't know, institutions and um, uh, meaning businesses? Thank you very much. Thanks, Marian, for the question. Uh, so um, as regards uh, the uh, involvement of government, I mean, we are a, a private company which is state-owned. So our main uh, shareholder is called uh, Caisse de Depot. Uh, so it's a, basically it's an investor, <laughs> public investor. Uh, so indeed, the uh, Caisse de Depot was uh, supportive of uh, what we were doing uh, in terms of uh, getting bonds. And as regards the process of getting bonds, I mean, I'm not a financial experts but my understanding is that we are doing that as a private company so really what we are doing is that we are borrowing on the private market uh, so this is something that any other private company could do uh, this is just specific because it takes the form of a green or sustainable bond and in that sense, it has a, a lot of specificities to, to follow. I mean, the, the process is quite long. I, I could go through that if, we, if there is interest. But really, uh, we are doing this um, as a private company that we are borrowing on the private market. Thank you, Margot. And maybe to, to mention, um, in terms of also benchmark, uh, so in the in the postal sector, from what I know, there is only one other uh, company which is Postenel, which has done a, a green bond. But I believe this uh, La Poste and Postenel are the only two cases uh, in, in the postal sector which have done that. While in other sectors, it's much more widespread. I mean, uh, especially in 2021, there has been like a, a surge in, in green bonds in, in the private market. So this is really something which is a, a very important uh, trend in other sectors. Thank you very much. Uh, Marco, we have a question uh, from Marcela Maron from Argentina. It's to you, but I, I think perhaps Verni, you could also uh, comment on this because the question is how can this be how can this model be replayed in Latin America so maybe first Margot and then Verney if you would like like also to speak after Margot so I, I think this is also linked to my answer to, to Marian uh, I think um, the first uh, condition depends on your status uh, so it means that probably for public uh, administration um, so uh, private, uh, sorry, sorry uh, public-owned companies, this is not possible. Uh, so you have to be able as a company 
uh, to borrow money on the, the private market. This is for me the, the first um, uh, criteria. Uh, the second one, as I was mentioning, is the, the specificities of the, the green bond, uh, because you could go on the market and, and borrow with, uh, any type of, of let's say classic bond uh, but a, a green bond uh, you have to have all your assets gone through an evaluation by an external auditor uh, so that the auditor uh, can uh, say whether the asset is eligible to be considered as green and this is really a, a very long process uh, some of our assets were not considered to to be eligible um, and um, so, so this is the, the second condition. And then the, the third condition or the third way, uh, the third step in the process is that to, you have to do a, a roadshow. Uh, so the roadshow basically is going to the investors to present uh, your bond, to present the details of your bond and to try to convince them uh, of uh, first that your uh, company as such uh, is a, a good one to invest in and secondly because this is a green bond you also have to uh, um, to be persuasive enough about your let's say overall sustainability uh, strategy thank you marco Verni, do you have any comments on this idea uh, how, how it could uh, translate to latin america Eh, sí, por supuesto. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, do doña Susan. Yes, of course. And thank you for the questions, Susan. As Margot stated, much like Margot stated, our, the Costa Rica Post has a company that has, it's the same structure, it's a private company. Uh, supported, sorry, we're, we're partly state owned, so we're supported by the state. All private companies, sorry, like ours, uh, supported by the state have to uh, respect and abide by carbon footprint rules. In Costa Rica, we are the country in our region that has the largest percentage of uh, renewable energy production. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think it's very important, and this is in response to our colleague from Argentina, but also uh, the others. We feel it's important to share information about legisl our legislation uh, and exchange that amongst ourselves to see how we can use this tool. OSCAR is an important tool. Uh, how can we present the projects that we're establishing and seek f in order to seek funding based on uh, the reduction of the carbon footprint? So first, the first step is focusing on acquiring goods and services that are environmentally friendly. That's very important. And as I indicated during my presentation, there are conditions that are compulsory for all of our providers, all our vendors. For example, the end of the life cycle of the products and services uh, that we purchase and procure. So there are programs that need to be uh, presented, and this is one of the obligations on the vendors. We think communication is very important, and Correos de Costa Rica would be very happy to disseminate our information so that we can uh, perhaps establish some best practices together. It would be a, a great pleasure for me to make this information available to you so that you can uh, pass it on. We, we can show you how we develop our projects and that way you can see how they could perhaps be a best practice, become a best practice in another country. So that will be my answer for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verni, and thank you very much uh, for your um, generous offer. Uh, I see that Marco would like to follow up and then Siva. Yes, actually, it was a question uh, to, uh, addressed to Verni. 
Uh, um, my question was about the uh, charging infrastructure, uh, because you presented the fact that you have uh, a fleet of uh, alternative vehicles, so in particular electric vehicles. So I was wondering uh, what about the uh, infrastructure, whether this is something uh, that you have developed on your own as a company or where there is a sufficient public infrastructure. Uh, because in Europe, uh, obviously, this is a, a big issue that there is uh, not enough um, infrastructure uh, which is publicly available. So I know La Poste, we, we had to develop our own infrastructure. So I was wondering what is the, the situation in, uh, in Costa Rica? Bueno. Eh, como les mencionaba, en Costa Rica yes. tenemos el... Mm -hmm. Well, as I may have mentioned, in Costa Rica, we're very fortunate in that we uh, receive support from the state. So we can work with institutions such as the electric, the main electrical company in Costa Rica. Their experts can help us with assessments. With respect to the project I mentioned, the green uh, part of it, the uh, CABE, the Central American Bank for Economic Integration in its funding process also carries out evaluations. We also have an engineering department which uh, works on this with us. So we, we did did a lot of work on uh, solar panels to become energy self-sufficient. The evaluations are sent to the engineering department. And all of this is done in concert with CABE and our engineers. With respect to the electric vehicles you mentioned now, we have a transport directorate or department which is constantly increasing its abilities, its capacities, and it has given us a great deal of help. And we also received a lot of help from Spain, where there's a huge number of electric vehicles. We asked them to help us and they gave us guidance and the necessary information which enabled us to develop our own capacity in running and maintaining electric vehicles. And it enabled us to set the parameters for speed, the distance, uh, range, power for these electric vehicles. Of course, all of those values are lower than a combustion engine. So we got the technical information from posts in other countries who had experience in this area. And that really helped us with our migration from combustion vehicles to electric vehicles. We uh, launched a pilot project. Now, if the pilot project is successful, then we're going to take it to scale and gradually migrate all our vehicles. I hope I answered your question. I don't know if there's any other information you'd like. Thank you, Verney. Siva, just before uh, you jump in, I'd like to remind everyone that under this format, we can only take your questions if you write them in the, the Q&A space because we, we don't have microphone uh, ability for you. Please, Siva, go ahead. Thanks very much, Susan. And um, I, I have a couple of questions for Margo. And uh, Margo, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation um, because as you know, um, the financing of um, structural change is, is a critical piece in, in, in this journey to, towards sustainability. Um, you made a very important point around the fact that um, the postal operators, at least in the case of Post NL and, and La Poste France, um, you are uh, effectively publicly listed companies and uh, you are uh, treated as commercial enterprises. Um, the, the question then becomes, um, is there a, a different um, way of doing things in terms of bond financing 
uh, for postal operators who are either government departments or, or government owned, wholly owned uh, and, and treated as uh, statutory bodies. And, and I'm thinking here loudly because I, 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 I don't have uh, the expert knowledge on this, but it seems to me that governments across the world, when you know, they, they do often issue bonds uh, and, and raise finances for public infrastructure spending. Um, is there scope for some governments, for example, to support their postal operators by issuing green bonds specifically aimed at raising funds to support infrastructure spending in, 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 the, in the postal sector to make it more sustainable? Um, have you seen any examples of that, or is this something that could potentially be a, a way forward? Um, that's my first question. Uh, and the second question is, um, are the bonds, the green bonds that were issued by La Poste France, are they traded in, in, the, in, the, in the market? Um, and uh, by, by which I mean, uh, you've issued the bonds, the bondholders, can they go on to sell it to someone else? Uh, and does that have a bearing on, on, on the returns on the bond uh, and, and, and the impacts on, on future bond raising opportunities? Thank you, Margot. So Shiva, I, I'm, I don't think I'll be able to answer all your questions because I'm not a finance expert, but I'll do my best. Thank you. Um, so um, about bonds uh, issued by the, the public sector, oh, sorry, the, the government uh, and public institutions. So I think, I mean, one of the, let's say traditional ways is uh, the, um, the, the status of the company, like for what I was mentioning, uh, that for La Poste, our main uh, shareholder is Caisse de Depot which is as such an investor. And one of the reasons why it became our main uh, shareholder is that because we needed more investment. So this is one of, let's say, the easiest way that your shareholder would uh, put money uh, and would um, uh, will finance uh, your development. Uh, and yeah, this was one, as, as I mentioned, uh, I'm repeating myself, but that was one of the main reasons why Caisse de Depot became our main uh, shareholder, while before, like two, three years ago, it used to be uh, the French state. Um, then um, I, I see another example. Uh, I think maybe this, this is quite close to what Costa Rica presented, uh, but there is uh, the case of the country where I'm in, so uh, in... Um, um, in Ireland, Unpost um, has, uh, has issued a bond or has done a, a bond uh, in the uh, European uh, Investment Bank. Uh, so this is something that uh, they, they have done to uh, green, their uh, green their fleet and to digitalize their post offices. Um, so there are some examples of postal companies using uh, public uh, investment with uh, the European Investment uh, Bank that I, uh, I can think of, yes. Um, yes, and about how it works, the, the bond, uh, I, I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, maybe what I can uh, mention in terms of uh, process uh, is about the, the rate. Uh, so I, I think what is um, interesting is in the, the process. So on the day when we issued our uh, sustainable and green bond, because we saw that there was over uh, subscription of our bond, we were able to lower our interest rate uh, dur during that day. So this was something very um, challenging because you had to see which was the, the best rate. I mean, to be able to decrease the, the interest rate, but not too much in order to, to make sure that you would not uh, scare some investors. So that was, I mean, this really worked like a very classical, typical bond that you have to find the, the, the best rate, which is uh, adapted to the market. You also have to see whether the, I mean, it, it, this was launched on a Wednesday. Uh, so on Monday, Tuesday, my colleagues followed very much with uh, the, the support of the auditor, what was going on uh, on, the, on the market. Uh, and they really decided on Wednesday morning, yes, this is the day where we have to go because uh, this is, uh, let's say, the, the best or the less worst situation uh, if you take into account uh, what is the, uh, the overall uh, global situation. So, yes, this really, in that sense, this, this really worked like a, 
a, a traditional uh, bond on the private market, yes. Okay, thank you. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bring in our UPU sustainability expert, Dr. James Hale, who's going to give us an update on climate funding and what the International Bureau will be putting in place to assist governments and DOs in this area. James, please. Thanks, Susan. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about funding and, and as Susan uh, introduced, our broader approach. So the UPU is scaling up its support for large-scale transitions to low emission postal operations. And as part of this, we are starting to review how postal operators are already funding this work. And we've heard today some great examples. Um, and we're also we're trying to understand what other options might be available that they haven't uh, yet explored. So it's still early days, uh, but our initial impression is that most postal operators are still seeking to fund uh, this investment internally through their annual budgeting processes. Um, a few posts have established green bonds um, and they are securing significant funding, significant levels of funding for immediate investment. Um, but that's not necessarily a model that works for everyone. So uh, there's different approaches. One of them is to look towards uh, development banks who issue grants and low cost loans for climate action, amongst other things. Uh, we've had some initial discussions with development banks and one of the uh, key messages that, that we have from them is that essentially they're looking for well-developed infrastructure investment project proposals. Um, and I, I'll explain what I, that means in a second. But in addition to that, they want climate projects that also have broader social and economic benefits. Um, so they want to obviously uh, maximize the climate impact, but they want to try and make sure that uh, they have as, as broader impact from a social perspective as well. So these banks tend to have dedicated funds for climate projects and their message is they're very open for applications in the postal sector. Um, I would also like to flag up the importance of national governments, energy ministries and cities as potential sources of funding, also source of investment, because these uh, national governments and regions and cities need to hit their climate, climate targets too. So they could be willing to invest in postal infrastructure as part of this process. It helps them to reach their targets. And I think that reinforces the points made by Rabia and Siva earlier about stakeholders and partnerships. Um, so our initial message is really to, to start to kind of in, in look more broadly than uh, the postal sector itself and look for partnerships and funding from uh, outside of our sector. And what's common across these different funding sources is the need to demonstrate climate impact. So it's really important that proposals for investments are supported by a good analysis of the baseline emissions of the organization. So that can be done using tools such as OSCAR. Um, and also credible estimates for how much that project will reduce the emissions, uh, because it, this is a really a key performance indicator of the projects. They want to know how much impact this is going to have on emissions of the post. So that was just a quick overview, but I hope it was useful. And I'm now going to hand back over to Susan and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, it looks like we're we're getting close to the hour. I would like to ask our, our speakers who are still here with us, uh, perhaps first Vernie, then Margot, and then I'll leave the last word to the director in charge of sustainability here at the IB, uh, Siva. So if the three of you would, would like to give us uh, some last remarks, please. First Vernie. Okay, well, I, I guess I could say that um, as a concluding remark, I would uh, simply like to thank you. Thank you, Susan, thank the UPU, and uh, all of you who've given me this opportunity to speak about uh, Costa Rica Post. Margo mentioned the bonds that La Poste is involved in. In our 
particular case in Costa Rica, when we carry out an, an analysis, uh, whether it be financial or administrative, that's how we uh, analyze how what, what the actual energy costs are and what savings can be made. Then, of course, the interest rate has to be attractive. So I think their best practices are useful for us as well as you. I would be happy to, once again, to share the information on our projects and see how uh, best practices, we can perhaps come up with best practices together. I would uh, like to ask if the rest of you would be interested in such an exchange of information. We personally would be very happy to pass on our information from Costa Rica. Thank you. Thank you, Vernie. And uh, we will be opening a UPU portal uh, of shared information and knowledge, a platform. Um, and so we we do look forward to contacting you very soon to, to follow up on that. Margo, do you have some quick final thoughts? Yes. Uh, uh, on my side, um, I have um, two um, two main conclusions, I would say, or two important messages uh, with, to me. So first, I think, and this was uh, mentioned also by James, I think uh, what is very important indeed is to be able to report, to be able to follow your carbon footprint and to be able to have the data available. At the end, all is about data and the proofs you, you are able to, to give, uh, being it to, to the investors, uh, being uh, while, uh, even if they are private or public, uh, but all is about uh, data and your capacity to, to report and to, to follow your carbon emissions. Uh, this is my first message. And my second message, I mean, we, we discussed uh, a, lot about, uh, a lot about funding opportunities because indeed sustainability requires heavy investments. Uh, but I think what you have also to consider is uh, the long-term uh, gains that you can get out of your investments. And I think this uh, should really be uh, the, uh, the, the driver that um, you, are, you have to think long term and that your uh, investments you may uh, today will bring you uh, savings in the long term. Thanks, Margo and Siva. Thanks very much, Susan. And let me first um, thank Margo and uh, Verne for uh, their presentations and taking the time to be here with us and, 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 and Rabia for sure who is not with us at the moment. Um, but I sort of took away three key points um, from our discussions. Um, one is uh, exactly the point that uh, Margot just made. Um, uh, actually measuring our energy consumption and its impact on the climate is critical. Uh, and so um, getting the tools for that is, is, is absolutely important uh, in place. Um, and the UPU, is here um, and it does have a tool called OSCAR. Uh, you've heard of how um, it's been deployed in Costa Rica and, and this is true of other uh, uh, designated operators. Uh, so I would invite others who are thinking about this uh, to contact the team here uh, on, on OSCAR de uh, deployment. We'd be more than happy to assist with that. Um, the, the second um, uh, point, which was a point that Verne, um, Verne uh, uh, raised, um, how important it is for knowledge sharing uh, and best practice sharing. Um, and, and this webinar is a testimony to this. We, we had at the start of it uh, approximately 141 participants. We've now got 128. It goes to show how much interest there is out there uh, on, a, on a very important and critical matter. Uh, and, and people are thirsty uh, for understanding what's happening out there in the world and to see whether that can be replicated. And so, um, you know, at, at the UPU, uh, Susan spoke about us creating a knowledge portal. Um, this very fact uh, of um, creating an environment where we can uh, share knowledge and best practices is critical and, and having that portal be, would be an important milestone in, in the right direction. And, and my final point is this, um, and it comes back to this, um, the simple issue of um, the fact that the postal sector 
is a key component of the logistics sector. And we do have a significant carbon footprint. Uh, and we do have a, a very important role to play uh, in terms of how countries uh, uh, help mitigate and adapt to climate, act, uh, climate change. Um, and it's time that we actually did uh, seek to address this at a, at a concerted level. And I'm really pleased that, you know, at the Abidjan Congress uh, last year, uh, we adopted um, uh, Congress Resolution C-17 unanimously uh, with, a, with a commitment to working towards voluntary targets uh, on this. Um, and, 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 and the UPU is, uh, is absolutely the platform within which uh, this can take place, uh, recognizing that there are different levels of development across our member states. So I, I think we're on the right direction. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but there is certainly interest. And I think there's certainly, um, uh, there is a call to action uh, which is in play and, and, I, and, and I'm really excited uh, about this journey myself. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Siva, and thank you for your participation today. And as you have already thanked the, uh, in the, the speakers that we've had on our panel, it is left to me to thank the interpreters and uh, to wish you all a very good morning, evening, or afternoon. And thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>